<clears throat> okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, thank you for being with us so far today. We've had some pretty lively discussions. Up next, we have Mitchell Horn, who's going to be talking about FreeBSD on Risk Five. So, Mitchell, you about ready to go? Or I see you. Yep. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I hear you. Great. Just going to share this. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this session. Uh, my name is Mitchell Horn. I'm a FreeBSD source committer, and I've been working on the uh, FreeBSD support for RIS5 for the past couple of years. Um, so what we're going to talk about today, we're going to briefly cover what RIS5 is. Um, we're going to talk about the software status from the perspective of FreeBSD. We're going to talk about the hardware status, um, kind of in relation to what hardware is available and, and what is FreeBSD support for that hardware. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the kind of upcoming changes to the uh, RISC V spec and the standardization process around that. And um, at the end, uh, I, I'll give my thoughts on and perspective on kind of where we are going as uh, an operating system supporting this architecture. Um, and then we'll end it off with some questions and discussion. So, um, so briefly, uh, RISC V is a CPU architecture, um, much like x86 or ARM. Uh, what's kind of unique about it is that it is it has an open source license. Um, so you don't need to pay any fees or have any special licensing to implement a RISC V compatible CPU. Um, anyone can do it. Um, and it's the instruction set architecture itself is designed to be modular or extendable so that um, if you are implementing a RISC-V core, um, you can include or exclude the, the portions of the ISA that are interesting to you. Um, so, for example, why implement a floating point hardware floating point unit if you know that you're just building an embedded chip that will never need it? Um, that's kind of the idea there. Um, RISC-V is a young architecture on the scale of CPU architectures. I believe the first publication was 2010, possibly 2012. It's kind of in that range of, this is only a decade old or so, and uh, FreeBSD's support for it has existed since initial version in 2017. So it's it's quite young on, on both the software and hardware side. Um, and we're gonna kind of see a little more about that. And then finally, I would say that uh, an ISA like RISC V is more than just that. Um, it's more than just what instructions does the CPU run. It's kind of, from the perspective of the OS, it's what do we have to, what do we support when running on this platform? And, and platform is a little broader in scope uh, than just ISA. So we'll come back to that idea as well. Um, the ISA is, broken up into kind of the base and extensions. So you can have a 32-bit uh, RISC V core. You can have a 64-bit one. The, the specification has made provisions for a, an eventual 128-bit core. And on top of that, you add your extension. So if you need a hardware floating point, you add the F or D or Q uh, extensions as, as needed. Um, for Atomics, you would implement the A extension for Atomic Instructions. And um, in that sense, it's it's modular. So at the bottom, I have examples of, oops, I have examples of all of these are kind of valid uh, RISC-V implementations in the eyes of the spec. Um, for FreeBSD's RISC V support in particular, we support the 64-bit GC um, RISC V core. So 
this has kind of the subset of functionality that you'd expect to see in any CPU that can run uh, Unix, that can run FreeBSD. So the hardware floating point, the atomic instructions, multiply and divide, those are all uh, required by our um, first five port. Uh, we expect the CPU to have three privilege modes, uh, the M, or machine mode, it typically runs the firmware, the supervisor mode, which is kind of the middle privilege level uh, is what runs the OS, so the FreeBSD kernel, and user mode, which runs user applications. Um, and for FreeBSD, as with any other architecture we support, we expect uh, that it has a memory management unit um, in particular, we support the 39-bit virtual memory scheme defined by the RISC-V ISA. Um, the, the official RISC-V target is uh, RISC-V 64. Um, there is a soft float variant that's supported in the tree where uh, you don't need to support the hardware floating point. Um, that doesn't get as much attention, and I think it's kind of an open question, will we need to continue supporting that in the future, but it's a low cost right now. Um, so FreeBSD just had a major release of 13.0. Um, so for the RISC-V port, where, where are we uh, as of FreeBSD 13? Well, one of the, um, I think, big achievements in 13 is that you can cross compile any uh, supported FreeBSD architecture with the version of Clang that comes in base and RISC-V is no exception there. So there's no need to kind of get your own external compiler. You can just do a build world and specify the target and it just works. Um, the RISC-V port ascended to tier two support from tier three um, where Tier three is kind of the experimental or in development architectures. Um, as of FreeBSD 13, RISC-V meets uh, all the requirements of tier two. So um, it's unofficial support. You, you, we don't necessarily provide security updates or things like that, but um, you can expect that the support in tree works and is maintained and it will not break too often. Uh, Good support for the QMU uh, software emulator platform and the High Five Unleashed, which was the first Unix capable uh, RISC V system on a chip that was released a couple of years ago. Um, we support booting with uh, UEFI and U boot. Um, so this kind of looks identical to how you would uh, boot on. Kind of an, an embedded ARM or ARM64 platform. You you have your uh, version of U-boot particular to the the system on a chip, and it supports the UEFI specification, so it can load our FreeBSD bootloader. Um, and then finally, as of FreeBSD 13, we started producing release images for RISC V. So the installer, virtual machine images, and a kind of generic SD card image. Um, are all produced and available for download. Um, so as of FreeBSD 13, I would say that kind of the major achievement is that RISC-V looks, uh, it looks the same as you would expect for other architectures in terms of support. We, we have CI, we have, it can be built easily in the same way that you do others. We have release images. It's it's no longer a specialized in development platform and, and the barrier of entry has lowered a little bit, at least on the software side. Um, now, beyond the base system, talking about ports and packages. So in the last year or so, we've done some uh, experimentation on cross compiling packages for RISC-V using the Poudrier and uh, QMU user mode emulation. This isn't a perfect process, but it works pretty well. And some 20,000 plus ports are buildable. 
that doesn't mean they're all tested necessarily, but uh, they compile. Um, and new as in the last two weeks, there are some official packages uh, being produced for RIS-5 for both the uh, 13 quarterly branch and um, current. So this is great. This is really great because it means you can say download the FreeBSD RISC V virtual machine image and say package install uh, Vim, package install Git, and you, you have it. Uh, whereas before you kind of had to do your own configuring. Um, and then kind of in the future, what will be next is there's, there's still lots more ports and packages that just require small uh, tweaks or patches to fix them, make them work on RISC V. And then I guess the larger items would be um, adding support for more language runtime. So Rust and Go and Java and anything like that, um, because that enables a whole other set of software. Uh, so that's mainly where we are on the software side. Uh, I wanna talk about the hardware side. Um, for a long time, RISC-V hardware has kind of been untouchable to just a standard user or people who aren't uh, people who aren't in the know or don't have a RISC V FPGA soft core that they can run it on are kind of just out of luck. And um, even myself, I, I've been working on this for a couple of years, and I only ever used uh, QMU up until recently. So. Um, this year and next, I think, is kind of an exciting time for people who have maybe had an interest in RISC V, but they said, oh, well, I, I, I don't have any access to hardware, so what, what's the point? Um, so we're going to look at some of these boards that are coming available. Um, the MicroSemi Polar Fire system on chip, uh, this, was, this was made available last year. Um, it's kind of based on the earlier uh, Sci-5 uh, Unleashed, it has the same uh, CPU Sci-5 cores in there, but um, this particular board comes with an FPGA fabric. Um, so it's kind of similar to the Xilinx uh, Zinc boards, if you've heard of those, where you have real CPUs that you can run FreeBSD on, but uh, if you're interested in kind of putting something on the FPGA that you can interact with that you can do with this. Um, so this is a pretty, it's fairly low powered board, um, but it is still available uh, for purchase. You can find that on Crowd Supply if you were interested in this one, specifically in the FPGA aspect, I think makes it an interesting platform. Um, I'm not, we, we don't have upstream uh, U-boot for this or, or boot support, but as far as I know, FreeBSD does run on this. And since it's based closely on the Hi5 Unleashed, uh, that's not very surprising. Um, Hi5 Unmatched is the successor uh, from Sci5. Um, this was announced last year and uh, after some shipping delays because of supply chain and everything like that, um, they've started shipping in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's available for, uh, it's available again on Crowd Supply and Mouser still. Um, this one comes in a mini ITX form factor and is kind of being marketed as a RISC V PC, the first one ever. Um, and this is a kind of an interesting choice on the part of. Sci5 who produces this board um, because they're pretty much a, a an IP company. They 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 sell their core their CPU IP to um, other companies, but they're producing a set of these boards to kind of push forward um, the RISC V hardware ecosystem. Um, so. This is, yeah, it's still available for purchase. This is gonna be probably the best performing uh, 
RISC V hardware we see in the next year or maybe two years. Um, but it's not necessarily the best value. One other notable thing of about this board is that it has a PCIe slot. Um, so in terms of FreeBSD support for this, it, nobody, uh, I don't think anybody's done bring up yet, but uh, people are starting to receive boards. And since it's based on, since it's similar to the, uh, the previous sci-fi board, uh, we'll have support for some of the drivers already. And I guess the main bit will be a driver for the PCI root complex. Um, but you can expect to see FreeBSD support for this this year, I would say. Um, the Beagle 5 is another board that was announced in the last few months or so. Um, this one is marketed a little different as the first affordable RISC-V computer. So um, coming at a lower price point, this is not trying to, to compete and be a, uh, a RISC-V PC, but uh, it is a compelling system on a chip. Uh, there's four cores, eight gigabytes of RAM, and uh, it it comes with, uh, it, it's, it's going to ship with um, a GPU and AI coprocessor. So um, things like computer vision accelerator, um, which is kind of interesting. This board is not shipping yet. Uh, I think, I believe later this year is the expected kind of production and purchase date. Um, but this brings us to the, the Beagle 5 beta. So uh, the Beagle Foundation and the, the manufacturing partners, they did a pre-production version of this board that they sent for free to some 300 uh, uh, developers who have an interest in RISC-V. Um, myself, I am one of these people that is a picture of the board I received with its chunky heat sink. And uh, I think there were five of us in total within the FreeBSD community who received these boards. Um, it's a slightly, it's a, it's a different, it's a different production version. So there's there's two cores, it doesn't have the GPU and um, the notable kind of difference is that there is a, um, some of the devices are not uh, cache coherent, whereas in the final production version, they are expected to be. Um, so in terms of have, of adding, FreeBSD support for this, um, this introduces a new kind of complication. And we'll come back to this idea of cache coherence uh, in the next section. Um, finally, the all winner D1 board. Um, this is the only, out of all that I've shown, this is the only one that's not based on a sci fi uh, core. Um, it is. I think also expected to ship this year um, for, again, kind of a more affordable price point. Um, I think what's interesting about this board is that it ships with an old version of the uh, hardware vector extension, um, which we're gonna talk about in the next section. Um, and it kind of suffers from the same level two cache coherence problem where uh, devices in the L2 cache are not coherent with one another and it needs a software solution to this. Um, if you're interested in obtaining RISC-V hardware beyond just purchasing it yourself, there is a interesting uh, program being run by uh, RISC-V International. They're giving away uh, boards to interesting applicants. So I think they expect kind of a project proposal where you say, oh, I wanna do this or that with a piece of RISC-V hardware, but they have a, a selection including all of those boards I just showed you and some others, um, but it's free as in free hardware. So they'll send it to you 
free of charge, but you're expected to do something with it. But um, this could be interesting for someone who wants to try out FreeBSD on RISC V and maybe has a specific kind of idea in mind for what they want to do. You can check out the link there and, and uh, apply to receive a board. Um, so next, I want to talk about um, ISA features and the standardization process and kind of what we can expect to see next from the RISC V ISA. Um, so the, the standardization process is run kind of like an open source project. The, uh, the RISC V spec is available on GitHub and anyone can submit a pull request and have that pull request considered for inclusion. Um, so for particular topics uh, of the specification, there are working groups that are working on these subjects. Uh, for example, the uh, vector extension, um, which is, the benefit of this is that uh, anyone who is interested any vendor, any uh, individual who has expertise and is interested in this standardization process can take part in it. Um, as things are proposed, eventually they get accepted and are frozen, and they, meaning they are not expected to change, and then they're ratified. And once, a, once something is ratified into the RISC-V spec, it means that it basically means you can implement hardware on it because that portion of the spec is not going to change. There might be additions, but uh, the low level behavior is going to remain consistent. Uh, the overall problem with running a, with defining your computer architecture in this way is that the process is very slow. So um, there are some things that if, it was a single vendor or uh, kind of entity devising the spec, they might be able to come up with more quickly, but there are things that from a software or hardware point of view are needed that have not yet been uh, ratified. So for example, these proposed extensions to the RISC-V ISA, the hypervisor extension, uh, the vector extension, the bit manipulation, and the packed, uh, I guess you'd say SIMD. I don't know exactly how you pronounce that acronym. Uh, all of these are proposed extensions that have been um, in progress for a couple of years now, uh, but they're not ratified. They're not accepted into the main RISC-V spec, and they're not guaranteed to be unchanging. So um, this, pros this poses problems for um, both hardware and software. Um, from the hardware side, you can't implement any of these extensions because you risk implementing something that will be outdated. For example, the all winner D1 board implemented an old version of the vector extension. And this means that, you know, when the vector extension is finally ratified, their chip is not gonna look like other chips that implement that. And software will either have to choose to handle that or they'll choose to ignore it and it won't be used. Um, I said it does have an impact on the software side as well. So uh, Linux and, and GCC specifically, they have a policy that they will not, ex they will not um, upstream anything, any of this support until they will not upstream extension support until that extension is ratified. So um, there is a large patch set for uh, the K Linux KVM support that has existed for I think two years now and it's not changing but it can't land into the Linux kernel because the hypervisor extension is still technically in progress. Um, FreeBSD, we haven't 
exactly defined such a strong policy around this, but uh, we don't, we aren't trying to support any of these extensions yet. Um, so in practice, we have the same policy. Um, what else is missing from the RISC-V spec? Uh, mainly the things to do with cash coherence. So um, it might surprise you if you know about other CPU architectures that there's the, the cash management instructions in RISC-V are underspecified. There are ways to, um, there are ways to handle the instruction cache on a particular core, but uh, other than that, it is kind of up to the particular hardware vendor. There's no, there's no way to flush the cache uh, with a standardized instruction. You have to do, you have to jump through some hoops. And in the same way, page-based cacheability attributes. So being able to say the, the page matched, mapped at this virtual address maps a device driver and we shouldn't try to cache that memory. There's no way to say that yet. Um, so now that we're encountering some of these cores like the Beagle 5 beta or the upcoming all winter core that um, don't handle device memory in a coherent way, um, the FreeBSD side has to handle this somehow, but there's no standardized way to do this. Um, so this is kind of posing a messy problem where we're depending on things that so far RISC-V has just been too slow to define. Um, and I guess I would go further to say that um, most of the decisions in places where the ISA is underspecified has happened because uh, one vendor decided how to do it and kind of others have copied them. So Sci-5 has defined some of the uh, things like interrupt controllers and, and, um, ca and cache controllers and other boards have copied that, but now we're starting to see more hardware emerge and they say, well, we need to be able to do some of these operations. We need to be able to flush the cache somehow. How do we do it? And uh, the standardization process is too slow to have an answer at the moment. So I think it'll be interesting to see how this goes. Um, as I note here, the, the cache management operation so has a working group, but it's still fairly young. The page-based cacheability attributes has a proposal, so that could emerge soon, but it doesn't help with the hardware that is being produced now. Um, so eventually we'll reach the point where these things are standardized and uh, there will still be these older boards that don't conform to that. And I guess the hope is that it won't be too messy to handle this. Um, so uh, finally, I'd like to finish off with kind of like a, where are we going? Um, so I think Verse 5 has a couple of, a couple of use cases where it has obvious value. So um, for this, as an ISA that can be implemented by anyone and extended in certain ways, it really makes sense as a, as a replacement for uh, kind of a, a customized ISA that, that large hardware uh, vendors might come up with. RISC-V definitely makes more sense there because it removes the burden of, okay, now we don't need to define our ISA, we can just implement our RISC-V core. I think it also makes sense as a, a teaching and research platform, platform um, due to the open source nature of the license. So um, the perfect example here is the Cherry and Cherry BSD projects. Um, that, that work, that security work at Cambridge is kind of the impetus for FreeBSD's RISC-V port and they're benefiting it 
from it a lot because uh, they can replace kind of their older MIPS work with new uh, with a newer RISC V implementation, and um, it's always going to be free for people to research on. Um, but as a kind of competition to x86 or ARM or in the server space, is RISC V does RISC V really have a compelling case there? I sort of think not yet, not at the present. Um, basically, there's there's going to be some years to kind of catch up with where the support for these other architectures are, and by the time that that work is done, does RISC V do anything new or better? Um, that's hard to say. So um, perhaps there are people who have perspective on this that would like to share it after the fact. Um, but what this means for FreeBSD, well, we were an early adopter of RISC V. The, the FreeBSD RISC V port was the first to land upstream even before Linux RISC V port. And um, I think as this architecture evolves, it only makes sense to continue um, improving our support for it and, and try to, you know, we, we see these new hardware platforms coming out now and it only makes sense to try to support them as best we can. Uh, yeah. So that's all I had to say. Here are some of the, uh, here are some of the places you can find information about this project, the mailing list, the wiki page and the IRC channel. Um, so I wanna open it up for kind of questions or discussion now. I'm not sure exactly how much time we have. So we're pretty <clears throat> tight on time, but what we can do is we'll go ahead and kind of start our break now. Yeah. Um, for about 10 minutes, but we'll keep answering questions during the break. So we'll kind of mix the two. So if folks need to run off to use a restroom or something, they can go ahead um, and then they can catch back up on the stream if they need to. Um, so we'll go ahead and start the 10 minutes, but then um, some questions that I saw on IRC. Um, one of them was uh, from Warner saying, did you run into any issues with QMU user mode on RISC-V? Um, I don't think there were any issues that were specific to RISC-V as far as I recall, but I didn't do any real hacking on that. I just kind of uh, tried it and said, oh, it works or it doesn't work. And then as um, Warner and Kyle were making improvements, we kind of saw improvements in the RISC-V, in the packages produced by the QMU user stuff. Um, so there aren't there weren't any specific risk five issues that I was aware of in regards to that. Okay. Um let's see. Uh Alan Jude likes your calendar, <laughs> just not a question. <laughs> and then there was a question on YouTube, which is uh Sean Webb had asked about uh the size of the virtual addresses that we're using and how it affects ASLR. Um, but I believe we, so currently, I think we do 39-bit virtual addresses. Is that correct? Yeah. And I think that's what's, um, I know there's a, I believe there's, there's a building in the spec for 48-bit, but I don't know if anything we currently run on supports 48-bit, except perhaps QMU. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So I don't think um, it's right. Yeah, maybe eventually, and, and to do 48, what we would have to probably start to do is, come up in 39 because I think that's the only one the spec mandates and then there's a way to kind of probe to see if 48 works or not using a, like a separate set of page tables that work in like in, the, in that mode and see if it works and then so kind of go from there. Yeah, exactly. It's it's more 48 bit uh, is more or less uh, compatible and just with an extra level of page tables from three right. to four. Let me go see what because I think there's some more questions on IRC. They weren't risk five questions. There were other questions. Mm -hmm. um, 
Okay. Well, I think we might be good. So let's use the rest of our, our time for our break. Um, so next session is going to be a 14 out of planning. Uh, I'll talk a bit more when we come back at the start, but there will be a hack MD uh, that we normally use and I'll post that URL in a bit. Um, but we're just to kind of give a little bit of a heads up. We're going to, we're actually, I'm trying to compare to previous releases. I want to have this kind of be a more of a living document that survives across multiple dev summits. Some currently have been playing with the integration of HackMD with GitHub, and I've pushed the current version. And so we can kind of have commits and that are almost like tags of, about what we discuss at different versions of this document at different conferences. So it's, it's already pre-populated with what we talked about in November and some updates, and then we're going to kind of continue to work through it and annotate it and update it and add new things. But we'll get more to that when we come back. So I'll see you all in about seven minutes or so.